This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Silvagi. Welcome to Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute, a think tank in Boston. Title IX, a law passed in June 1972, prohibits federally funded educational institutions from discriminating against students or employees based on sex. Its intent, clearly stated, is that, quote, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, unquote. Fifty years later, this past June, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona proposed rewriting Title IX to better reflect the ideological orientation of the Biden administration, triggering a two-month window for public comment, which closed last week. That window received more than 200,000 comments, revealing widespread alarm that the worthy goals of Title IX could be distorted in a way that redefines harassment, dispenses with due process, and blurs the boundaries of the locations where violations may be enforced. Concerned observers should examine whether this redefinition of Title IX is a welcome and useful modernization of an outdated law, or rather an ideologically driven misstep that undermines the original important goals of Title IX, chills the culture of free debate within universities, and leaves students and faculty careers vulnerable to the assertions of any who take offense. My guest today is Allison Soman, legal fellow in the Center for the Separation of Powers at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Ms. Soman has researched and written extensively on Title IX's interpretation and implementation. Ms. Soman will share with us a history of Title IX, including ways its application has evolved over the past 50 years. She will also discuss how the recently proposed amendments could affect the rights of students and faculty to speak and the recourse of those accused within its new enforcement regime. When I return, I'll be joined by Pacific Legal Foundation legal fellow, Allison Soman. Okay, we're back. This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Silvagi, and I'm pleased to be joined by Pacific Legal Foundation legal fellow, Allison Soman. Welcome to Hubwonk, Allison. Hi, it's great to be here. Well, before we start, I think it's only fair to our listeners uh, um, that you're long overdue for a visit to Hubwonk. Given that I've already had uh, Ilya, your husband, on several times, I just want to say in my defense, uh, my uh, my explanation is I wanted to have a little more practice uh, before uh, with my interview skills before I had you on. So welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. All right. Um, now we're going to talk about Title IX, uh, a, a law that um, uh, actually was passed I was surprised to learn in 1972, back in the Nixon administration. So it's just past its 50 year um, anniversary. So for our listeners who are unfamiliar with the topic, uh, what is Title IX, uh, both in letter and in spirit? How does it help us? So Title IX is, as you say, a 1972 law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex by all recipients of federal funding. So that includes virtually all K through 12 public schools and virtually all colleges and universities. It's perhaps best known for its impact on sports teams, on trying to uh, make sure that men and women have equal opportunities in athletics, but its reach certainly isn't limited to that. It covers any area where there might be sex discrimination. Okay, so you, you uh, paint in broad strokes, it's institutions of higher learning that, uh, or of education that, that receive federal funds. What percentage, is that, is that everybody or is that just a small percentage of, of schools out there? Um, I don't know the exact percentage. My off-the-cuff estimate would be something like 99%. Um, virtually all colleges and universities take federal funds in some form. Uh, probably the biggest chunk is through the student loan program because almost all colleges have some students who receive federal student loans. I believe that there are a couple schools that are conscientious objectors, uh, including notably the conservative leaning Hillsdale College in Michigan, but they're pretty few and far between. Okay, now we're talking about sort of the evolution of the, the law, which seems to have very, very good intent, which is we don't wanna discriminate based on sex, so we're gonna make sure uh, everybody gets fair treatment. Uh, at the beginning, did, did the law anticipate the need uh, for fair treatment um, I'm going to use women and men. I, I know it can go the other way, but was it? Did it originally anticipate um, protection from uh, violence or threatening behavior uh, from? I'm, I'm going to say from men to women, but it could be men to men or women to men. Did it anticipate those problems? 
So in the sense um, of whether Congress was talking about that, if one looks back at the legislative history at the floor debates, no, there was little or nothing about those kinds of concerns in the congressional record in the 1970s. So I really wanted to ensure that just as a, a fair shake at school uh, that one wasn't being discriminated based on sex. Uh, really, uh, a, a great deal has has come to uh, to this law in in the in the meantime. So um, so as it's evolved, um, uh, we've needed to define what constituted an environment that made women less able to learn. I guess the essence of those those additions to the law were that though they got equal funding for sports teams or programs, uh, 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 perhaps a woman's experience in a school was less than a man's, or therefore she had less access to the education there. O owing to some sort of hostile environment. Say more about how this concept evolves, that, that um, uh, a, uh, someone's education needs uh, the defense of Title IX owing to either a hostile environment or something like that. Sure. So before Title IX came about um, in 1964, there was Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which applied to employment to employers who have more than 15 employers. The concept of sexual harassment law was developed in cases involving employment and was later exported uh, into the Title IX context because Title IX has nearly the same wording as the Civil Rights Act's prohibition on sex discrimination. It's kind of an odd fit because when most, if you ask somebody on the street to explain why sexual harassment or sexual assault is wrong, they're not usually going to lead with it's wrong because it's a form of sex discrimination. They're going to lead with it's wrong because it's inherently wrong. Um, it diminishes someone's sense of consent or it diminishes a woman's or target sense of autonomy over her own body. Uh, nonetheless, because this was the statutory language that feminists had, um, these cases got brought. And the original cases from the 1970s, 1980s uh, often had quite egregious and sympathetic facts. Uh, the Title IX case that first applied sexual harassment in the context of federal funding recipients, Davis versus Monroe County, really did have terrible facts about the plight of that little girl. Uh, the school district really was deliberately indifferent uh, to, the, to the situation that she faced. Yeah, I didn't mean to diminish the, the moral component of, of uh, discrimination or harassment, rather just the, the legal definition of it. Um, you know, I, I know it's morally wrong. It, it, you know, it, it's just I, I would think mm -hmm. that uh, from a Title IX perspective, it interferes with the purpose of Title IX, which is to ensure um, equal access to education. So I agree with that. I just think that it was kind of an odd conceptual leap for the courts to go from a statute that was based on discrimination into this area, which is traditionally more the province of tort law or criminal law, and try to graft that kind of tort or criminal law um, regime onto what was a discrimination statute. And I think that some of the problems and tensions that we see in this area come from courts and, and agencies trying to use a discrimination statute to take on these kinds of moral problems that, again, have more traditionally been in the bailiwick of something like uh, torts or criminal law. This is a, this is a good point. So uh, regardless of how it got into it or is interpreted to be included in Title IX, whether it's uh, a rational leap or uh, uh, you know, an odd one, uh, it's there. Uh, so um, in, in the process of forbidding, let's say, harassing behavior, you know, reprehensible behavior, perhaps, um, one must uh, also have a process for adju adjudicating. Again, this is we're, we're talking about the law uh, or a, a pseudo law when, in the context of an educational uh, institution. Um, uh, how have these rules evolved? Meaning, when one breaks those rules, how how have they been adjudicated? Let's say from 1972 to uh, to current times. So in theory, Title IX doesn't really say, from the plain text, uh, doesn't really say anything about how schools have to adjudicate, have to adjudicate uh, these, ki these kinds of claims. However, once courts interpreted Title IX to say that schools had an affirmative obligation to respond uh, to these kinds of claims of sexual harassment and assault, um, most schools put into place some kind of disciplinary procedure to make sure that they weren't just throwing uh, accused students out of school, will out of out of school willy nilly. Um, 
in the Obama administration, uh, Catherine Lehman, uh, who is then the Assistant Secretary of Civil Rights, uh, is now back in that job for a second time around, really made a push to get schools to crack down on students who were accused of sexual assault or harassment. Uh, she issued a series of informal guidance letters that, was in that were intended to make sure that schools really responded vigorously to these kinds of complaints, usually though not always from female students. And schools who were understandably nervous about losing a big chunk of their federal funds responded by leaning hard in the direction of cracking down on accused students, mostly again, but not all male, to the point that one started seeing these stories in national media about, again, mostly young men who felt that their schools had responded unduly harshly to very thin accusations. Uh, one problem in the traditional criminal law system, uh, first there's investigation that's usually conducted by police officers, and then there's a prosecutor who, hand, uh, who pushes for the charges, and there's an independent judge who is, who is entitled to make final decisions. Um, in the Title IX context, instead of having these separate people who are supposed to check each other's biases and make sure that no one person is overreaching, a lot of schools were encouraged to use what's called a single investigator model, whereby there's basically one person at the school who serves as investigator, serves as judge, judge as jury, or serves as prosecutor. And so if that person is biased against the accused student, that accused student is really in a vulnerable and unfair position. One of the important reforms of the Trump appointees Department of Education was to say, no, you can't do this anymore. Unfortunately, the proposed Title IX rule would bring back those single investigators. And that's one point that we discuss in our Title IX comment letter on the Pacific Legal Foundation. Sure, sure. I want to unpack a lot of what you just said, but uh, let's take it one piece at a time. Uh, what you've said is now um, that the federal government, um, sort of as a condition of all the funding it provides, it says you have an affirmative responsibility to ensure that this uh, harassing and uh, bad behavior doesn't happen. And if you don't do that, we will perhaps suppress or hold back money. So in response, schools uh, impose these, these processes that uh, adjudicate these cases. Uh, in the past, uh, they have been fairly strict. Again, maybe they've made the national media where um, they portrayed something uh, akin to a kangaroo court where a, a, a male, usually male, but not always male, uh, defendant is, is assumed to be guilty uh, and the process is you know, seemingly very unfair. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Betsy DeVos in the last administration or the Trump administration tried to impose, let's say, what we consider normal um, uh, parameters of, of, of due process. As you say, there's an investigator, an impartial judge, and, uh, and a very elaborate process. And what we're talking about in modern times, in, in your recent uh, comment piece in, in the news and your uh, uh, letter, uh, is that we are uh, thinking about rolling back and going back from what we might consider due process uh, uh, defense of a, an accused student more towards, again, I use the term kangaroo court, but what you would characterize it as is a, a single person, be they objective or not, who will find the facts, uh, determine guilt, and impose a penalty uh, with very little recourse from, from the defendant. It, have I summarized your, uh, your account fairly well? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So this brings us all to modern times when we're talking about making substantial different uh, changes to Title IX. Uh, actual, you know, we, we've spelled out what, what would go from uh, yesterday and to tomorrow. Uh, we've just ended a, uh, was it a two-month comment period uh, whereby uh, the federal government said, this is what we'd like to change. We'd like you to uh, make comments. I believe there were 200,000 comments, some of them more, more alarmed than others. Uh, yes. This was among the more alarmed. So you laid out very clearly what you thought was the difference between what had been the rule, again, in the past administration, uh, and what is proposed to be the new rule. And you laid out some really, uh, what I thought, very um, alarming um, uh, observations of those changes. And I think our listeners, be they of the left or the right, might also be alarmed by what, what the, um, uh, the future may hold. So let, let's take it apart one at a time. Um, uh, let's talk about the principle um, whereby um, you know, we don't want students, be they male or female, to be harassed or be, be in a classroom where they feel they can't learn owing to you know, some harassment by some other student or, or, or professor. How is the term harassment 
being uh, redefined or defined both in the past and what would be the new version of harassment? Sure. So the Supreme Court in the landmark 1995 case, Davis versus Monroe County, interpreted Title IX to reach sexual harassment that is severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. And in doing so, that definition essentially safeguards protect, protected speech under the First Amendment, so speech about politics that touches on matters of sex and gender or very isolated incidents, um, someone asks someone else out and then that person says no, that kind of relatively minor incident would not be swept in because it's not considered severe and if it's happening once it's not very pervasive. I see. The Department of Education, however, re uh, redefines that rule to reach um, harassment that is either severe or pervasive. So in theory, something that's not really very pervasive, but strikes the decision makers of the Department of Education as severe could be brought in. And that encourages federal, federal funding recipients, colleges and universities, K-12 schools to really crack down on anything that could put, putatively be sexual harassment, uh, even something that doesn't really seem very significant. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of tension there between our sort of uh, uh, First Amendment rights to say things that are even uh, offensive or hateful, perhaps, uh, uh, and and one's uh, prerogative or a right to not hear those uh, words. One thinks of going to college to encounter uh, views we don't agree with, but this seems to, in a sense, uh, merely um, allow someone to regard uh, either a remark or perhaps a subject area or perhaps a uh, research topic as being offensive uh, and, and um, causing harm. Uh, and to me, this is like the antithesis of, of a university environment whereby the one does not want to be harassed, sexually harassed, one does want to be, um, let's say, free to hear things that one might consider severe. Um, explain to me how, let's say, you would imagine that this tension between the First Amendment and these new uh, uh, definitions of harassment could possibly be resolved. So I think that there are a few things that the Department of Education could do to at least make it better, even if it wouldn't, wouldn't eliminate the problem altogether. First, uh, just go back to the old definition of harassment, severe and pervasive, and that would make it clear that relatively rare instances aren't covered. Second, I'd like to see the Department of Education add an explicit safeguard that anything that covers matters of public affairs, so somebody says something controversial uh, about sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, but it's just speech, it's not something that's targeted at a particular person or that has a physical component, that kind of speech about public affairs uh, would not be covered. Uh, third, there have been, there's been some concern that the Department's definition could reach research activities uh, in a different matter. Uh, my public interest firm, Pacific Legal Foundation, represents an osteologist, and part of what she teaches her students is how to classify bones as male or female in many areas of archaeology. That's helpful to find out information about what gender roles or what kinds of different activities uh, in a in, um, in a in a tribe of in a tribe of Native Americans or in people from a cave civilization, uh, what their lives were like. However, there's been a move among some archaeologists and osteologists. Um, to avoid classifying skeletons as male or female on the theory that this is transphobic because you can't possibly know the inner gender identity of a skeleton. And so in the sufficiently heightened and charged political environment, uh, someone could arguably claim that she is engaging in discrimination based on gender identity by teaching her students uh, how to classify skeletons uh, based on their status as male or female, or or that by publishing um, in ways that point to the sex of a skeleton, that this is arguably transphobic. Uh, we want to make clear that research of the kind that Professor Weiss does that touches on sensitive issues around gender identity, that can't qualify as, as sexual or gender identity harassment under the rule. Uh, research, free inquiry, scholarly debate should be explicitly protected. 
fourth, there's a provision that interprets Title IX to reach off-campus speech that's purely online. So say somebody posts something uh, to a personal Facebook or Twitter account that's about, that's, a, that's about sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, even if that's not coming onto the campus environment because the person's doing that at her house over Christmas break or something, that could arguably constitute harassment under this rule. We think that this broadens the rule significantly and its reach. And so therefore we recommend that because Title IX classifies harassment as discrimination taking place in an education program or activity that the Department of Education makes clear that it shouldn't reach this kind of off-campus purely online speech. Wow. Uh, I think probably our listeners, our heads are exploding. Uh, the notion that, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for this, but the dimorphic nature of human as, as mammals, the 50, I think it's 5,400, if I remember, uh, uh, species of mammals, uh, male and female, um, uh, if we acknowledge that either in our science or in our offline uh, social page, we may get in trouble. Uh, so much trouble, in fact, that it, we may lose our space in our esteemed university or in our faculty position. Uh, you know, I, I'm having a hard time uh, understanding this myself, uh, but you know, I'm 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 holding on for dear life here. I'm, I'm uh, appreciate your your uh, your uh, testimony here. Um, so let's say we have gone down this terrible road and acknowledged that uh, uh, Native Americans uh, did have different roles for men and women, uh, and we do our research and we get in trouble. Um, what is uh, the uh, the process for um, uh, for adjudicating this? Uh, you know, who can be the accuser? Is it does it have to be the person in the classroom or someone who heard it in the lunchroom? Uh, and uh, what is the recourse when one is ac accused in general? Well, we don't devote a lot of attention to this in our particular comment, but one potential problem with this rule is that it does recognize what it calls third party accusers, such that even if somebody is not actually directly involved in a particular instance of alleged harassment, uh, he or she can still report it to the Title IX office at a school, and they're still bound to investigate in that, in, in that instance. And that does um, open up um, an institution's potential or an individual uh, potential liability under Title IX, and that's of some concern. As you and I were talking a little bit about earlier, um, there are significant due process problems with this rule. One major one is that it does allow institutions to again use the single investigator model where a single individual who's the Title IX coordinator can essentially act as judge, jury, investigator. And so if that individual is biased against an accused person, um, then that accused person is in a very vulnerable and unfair position. And that's something that we at Pacific Legal Foundation think is inconsistent with basic principles of due process. And so that part of the rule should be changed. In our comment letter, we also talk a little bit about the importance of this safeguard of cross-examination. In the 2020 rules issued by Secretary DeVos and her appointees, they made clear that in instances where credibility mattered, uh, accused students have the right to cross-examine, uh, not necessarily personally individually, but through an attorney or through another advocate, uh, the witnesses in a Title IX proceeding. That's an important safeguard to make sure that people are telling the truth, that they don't just fold up under the heat of some tough questions. While there are issues about, with, about um, people feeling uncomfortable with cross-examination or facing inappropriate pressure, I believe that the 2020 rule handled those issues adequately. And so to remove the cross-examination safeguard is, in the view of my Pacific Legal Foundation colleagues and me, a very important breach of due process. And we urge the department to bring back those safeguards. Yeah, um, again, I'm trying not to be overwhelmed. To me, I, I, your work is uh, worthy, uh, but it seems like you're holding back the tide with a broom. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to imagine, though, the chilling effect that all of these rules have in an academic setting, whereby one isn't free to even you know, share one's life work if, if it doesn't align with modern uh, uh, ideology. Um, uh, and one, even if one can defend it, uh, one has to uh, hope for the... Uh, the kind uh, 
consideration of the adjudicator, right, uh, without any defense and and with no one to scrutinize the validity of the accusation, you're really uh, the subject of the whim of, of the school um, in that case. So um, uh, you, you, you alluded to a fact that I think is also important, um, and I just want to make sure I understand. When we talk about these Title IX rules, they were specifically designed to uh, affect behavior in, in an academic or um, uh, in a school setting. Um, but that this new guideline has sort of erased that boundary between uh, behavior that happens in a classroom or in a, in a study environment, in a research environment, and what you know, might happen in the, uh, down the street at the, at the Black Cat in the, in the cafe at the, um, uh, you know, on campus. Uh, share more with our listeners where, if, if there is any sort of legal or, or principle that, that limits what one can do or when, once one enters the world of academia, one is subject to saddle, Title IX uh, morning, noon, and night. So I believe the statute says discrimination in an education program or activity. And so the question becomes, when does discrimination that's outside of the school become discrimination in an education program or activity? Um, if you're studying abroad with your school or if you're on a school trip, for sports debate, something like that. I think that's a case of discrimination outside the school that is discrimination in an education program or activity. But for the reasons you suggest, um, if one of your classmates writes a nasty Facebook post while off campus and you see it later, I just think that's sufficiently attenuated from the education from the education program or the education environment to qualify as being an education program or activity. And so I don't think it's appropriate for the Ed Department to issue rules that would make an institution responsible for this kind of uh, speech or that happens elsewhere. Yeah, again, I don't want to wax too uh, philosophic here, but um, it seems to me this is, you know, broadly speaking, a, an assault on free speech. And again, the magic of free speech, it doesn't defend speech we like, but rather the speech we don't like. Uh, and particularly in a, um, in a university setting where it's absolutely essential, I can only imagine, you know, again, I'm, I'm here in Boston, this is sort of the Athens of America, every other person on the street is a student, if not every person on the street is a student. Um, so to me, this is a, a chilling effect, not just in academia, but in, in society in general. Um, again, I'm going to bring up the fact that we're in Boston. Uh, not long ago, we had, uh, what was it, the uh, Postmaster General, Mr. Comstock, had these rules against um, obscenity, where we imagine that words were indeed harmful. It seems that that's come full circle. We know that violence is harmful, but uh, words we used to regard as, as not. Um, what do you think, um, again, I'm, I'm going to bring up Comstock. We, we were notorious for banning books. We, books banned in Boston were well known. Um, we seem to be going down a similar dark path. I, I don't want to uh, panic. Uh, I maybe uh, uh, I'll calm down after we, I think about this more deeply, but um, where do you see this going? Uh, it, it seems it, on a roller, you know, uh, uh, rolling down a hill with no end in sight. We, we really look like we've essentially um, banned virtually any, anything uh, that might offend anyone at any time. So I do agree that if adopted, this rule has a broad definition of harassment that could infringe on a lot of protected speech, and I'm very concerned about. That said, um, I think my colleagues and I are looking for opportunities to challenge this rule in litigation once it becomes final. I don't think we're the only public interest firm in the country that has that interest. And there have been a few high profile cases in earlier administrations where people have stood up and fought back. And while I don't want to make that fight sound easier than it, than it is, I don't think it is. Um, I think that many Americans have a strong sense of freedom, care a lot about liberty. And so I think that that is this rule is. Um, it's not the end. I think people will stand up and fight back. Uh, let me also tap into your legal expertise and talk about whether this rule, which is being made within the executive branch, within the Department of Education, it seems to me this is a substantial change, a substantial change that really ought to be, uh, and when you're changing laws, we ought to be looking towards the legislative branch, the Congress, to be doing changes like this. I guess we'll call it, uh, I've learned these terms from uh, Ilya, this is a major questions issue, and, and perhaps it's not something that is in the purview of an executive branch to, to even change. What is your view on whether this is a, uh, a the, the prerogative of, of the um, uh, Department of Education? 
Sure. So let me just step back and give a little bit of background about the major questions doctrine. Um, this is a rule most recently developed through the Supreme Court's opinion in West Virginia versus EPA that says that in order for an executive branch agency to issue binding rules in a given area, Congress must speak clearly to the issue. The idea being that Congress doesn't want to hand out open-ended grants of power to administrative agencies, but rather Congress thinks that it should be empowered to make these big decisions on its own through the most democratic branch. This, um, this doctrine has become particularly relevant in the pandemic era because there were several big cases in which administrative agencies uh, really seemed to make big grabs of power uh, based on statutes that were enacted decades before that didn't really fit the problem that it looked like the agency was going after. And so the court had to apply this doctrine in several different circumstances to tell the agency is no, you're not actually empowered to do that. While there aren't a ton of Supreme Court cases on the contours of the major questions doctrine, um, I do think that the expansion of Title IX into sexual orientation and gender identity fits that bill. This looks like an agency that has been concerned about discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity as these issues have become politically salient and wants to use a 50-year-old statute to go after those problems even though they don't really fit. And even though the 1970s Congress wasn't thinking about sexual orientation and gender identity in the same terms that we do today, and almost certainly didn't intend for Title IX to be used in this manner. So our listeners who are uh, four square behind um, these kinds of changes should really also um, uh, want it to be changed properly, which is by the branch of government accountable to us, the voters, Congress, uh, not to um, the administrative state. Um, so we're running out of time. Uh, I'm, in, I'm enjoying our conversation. Um, we do have to talk about, let's say, the political environment that we're in. We are, uh, let's say, a few months before the midterm elections and two years away from the next choice of a next administration. Um, these changes, were they to go through? Uh, how fragile are they? Can uh, Would they stick or are they um, uh, subject to the vicissitudes of the next Congress or the next uh, administration and they could just as easily be done, uh, be undone. So Congress can certainly pass legislation at any time that would clarify Title IX to avoid these to avoid these kinds of changes. So that's always one avenue against them. I suspect also that there will be litigation in some of the areas that I mentioned and possibly others. I'm not very conversant in freedom of religion implications of these rules, but there are other attorneys who are who do have concerns in that area, for example. Um, I think one problem with handling these issues in the executive branch agencies as opposed to Congress is that you do see these kinds of yo-yo effects in which one administration goes in, takes a very aggressive stance, and then another one comes in and claws it back rapidly, and there's not the kind of stable political compromise or settlement that you might see if Congress sat down and senators who are in the middle, the Joe Manchins, Olympia Snow, Susan Collins of the world said, okay, what's a modest approach, a modest amount of protection um, where that, 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 could, that could meet in the middle? That might be a more stable outcome if we had a proper separation of powers that would, in which Congress would actually directly speak to these issues. Um, in the Obama administration, Catherine Lehman, the then Assistant Secretary, uh, at, uh, acted in this area through a series of non-binding guidance documents, which could essentially be promulgated any time and revoked any time. The Trump administration had concerns about doing these kinds of substantive rulemakings through this kind of informal process. Uh, the informal guidance process really isn't meant for these kinds of big changes in policy. So they issued binding rules in 2020 that were meant to be more stable um, and that were really meant to take into account public input more appropriately. Now, what the 
Biden administration is doing here. They are going through the binding rulemaking process. They are seeking notice and comment, which is good that there aren't those kinds of procedural abuses happening that happened earlier in the Obama administration that does that would make it harder for a new administration to undo because then they would have to go through a new round of notice and comment rulemaking and that would and that would make life harder and longer should a new administration want to overturn these rules. So perhaps this is again last question uh, for our listeners who uh, consider a pioneer not just a think tank but a think and do tank. Is there anything uh, a listener whose hair is on fire right now uh, might do to um, further the cause of let's say uh, more free speech? I, I think no one wants to look at a, um, a future whereby their their kids or they themselves are going to a school where they have to watch everything they say. Uh, their their uh, academic or or teaching career may be um, ended in a, in a moment. Uh, and frankly, their own sons and daughters might uh, get sent home from school for something and, and you know, un unwise uh, remark. What, what, what can our listeners do? Sure, so unfortunately the formal comment period to submit comments to the education department is closed. That said, uh, writing to Congress, uh, calling your member of Congress is always an option while schools can adopt these one-sided procedures, they don't have to. So simply keeping up the heat on your school so that um, bowing to the most aggressive uh, possible interpretation of Title IX. If, there, if schools are getting heat from both directions, they're more likely to take a moderate course that's respective, respectful of due process and free speech, even if, um, even if yes. Yeah. So write to your local dean, uh, perhaps, in addition to your uh, local uh, representative in, in Congress. So that I've really enjoyed our conversation today, Allison. Thank you. I, I think I had the, you know, the, I finally found the better Soma for my show, and I, I really appreciate your expertise and your time and, and, and your insight today. Thank you for joining me today on Hubwonk. Thank you so much. Cheers. This has been another episode of Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute. If you enjoyed today's episode, there are several ways to support Hubwonk and Pioneer. It would be easier for you and better for us if you subscribe to Hubwonk on your iTunes podcatcher. It would make it easier for others to find Hubwonk if you write a favorable review or offer a five-star rating. We're always grateful if you want to share Hubwonk with friends. If you have ideas for me or comments or suggestions about future episode topics, you're welcome to email me at hubwonk at pioneerinstitute.org. Please join me next week for a new episode of Hubwonk.